This is the Alden Report. Today's episode is brought to you by FrontRowBenefits.com, connecting consumers and businesses with front row access to the greatest health insurance that the United States has to offer. Visit FrontRowBenefits.com. Folks, listen, if you're like me, if you own a business, if you have a family, or if you're an individual and you're looking for front row access to healthcare, maybe you're tired of your premiums going up. Maybe you don't want to pay those high deductibles anymore. Maybe you're tired of paying more and more for your monthly prescriptions, and you want to make sure that you're getting that VIP access, that front row access, then visit FrontRowBenefits.com and get a free quote. They're connecting consumers and businesses with the top level insurance carriers in the United States at discounted prices. Visit frontrowbenefits.com. That's frontrowbenefits.com. This is the Alden Report. All right. Well, my name is Mike Alden. We are here in Blue Bay Studios. And as always, I'm wearing my 99 cent, I guess we're going to call them aviator glasses, uh, for for a reason. They're only 99 cents. And for those who've been watching and listening, you kind of know uh, uh, why they do that. You know, I have actually two guests on in my seven years of doing this. I'm trying to think. I think we've only done this maybe once or twice before. Uh, but I have the co-authors of a really interesting book titled Dark Cockpit, How to Communicate, Lead, and Be in Control at All Times Like an Airline Captain. It's a really, really uh, interesting Title, really, really interesting concept. And my next guests uh, are also two interesting fellows as well. Emil Dovrolovsky, I believe I pronounced that right. Uh, Captain Good. Emil Dovrolovsky and Oct- Octavian Pantish as well. So uh, Emil is, is, is an airline pilot uh, and Octavian as a CEO. He's an entrepreneur. He's a business coach. He's a business consultant. And I, I'll tell you, I got a lot of questions for these guys. One, I want to know how these guys even got together because I thought they were both pilots until I started to read the book, but they're not. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a really interesting perspective uh, about what they have to say. There's a lot of books out there, a lot of business books out there. And then most of it is a lot of the same stuff. Even some of my books, it's kind of like what I've learned from others. Right. Um, but these guys have a really interesting perspective on business and life in general. Uh, please help me welcome Emil and Octavian. Thanks, guys, for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you for the invitation. You know, I, you I just said your first names in, in, at the end there because you know I got to be honest. It's you know it's uh, I'll, I'll probably get get it down uh, your your last names uh, before the before the podcast is over. So um, no worries. So so uh, let's just let's just my uh, first question for you is okay. So you you both, you both co-wrote this book. Interesting again topic. Great title. I love the title. Um, how'd you guys get together? Like how how'd you guys become friends and, and co-write a book like this? Uh, so uh, I was flying on vacation with my family. This was in the summer of 2008. And um, I'm sure that um, you and many of people who are listening and watching today have been on flights when, when the captain addresses the, uh, the passengers, you don't really understand what they're saying, right? It's like they're holding their nose and say, we want to be gentlemen and, we're gonna, and you don't understand. Well, on this particular flight, I was able to understand every single thing that the captain was communicating to us, what the weather was going to be like, what we can see on the left hand side, right hand side, temperature, everything. Of course, the flight was smooth, uh, but also I, I liked the, the clarity in communication. So I, I asked to meet the captain and uh, he was uh, Captain Emil Dobrovolsky. And that's, uh, that's how we met. We then, uh, I then invited him to um, come speak to my team uh, f- uh, several times about stories from aviation, lessons from aviation, and we were very uh, pleasantly surprised that the stories were not only engaging, but they're also very useful and we could find many bridges. And then we invited Emil to address to a, a speaker to some of our clients at their own conventions. And so, and whether it was pharma or banking or FMCG or whatever, again, the audience clicked, the audience found the messages valuable to them. So about Two years ago, three years ago, I said to Emil, you have to write a book because there's a treasure of know-how in aviation. Uh, And of course, all pilots rely on it to make sure that all flights turn out okay. But uh, it's a pity if 
people outside the aviation don't have access to that know-how. And uh, he said, Octavian, um, fine, but let's write it together. I, I had some written some books before, so that's how we got together. And the book came out. It's available now on Amazon and all those places. And the feedback is very good. And we see that people are buying, very different people buy the book. It's uh, people who want to become better, they buy the book, whether it's entrepreneurs, managers, or, but also parents for their teenage kids. Also people for their parents who are maybe afraid to fly, they're in their 60s or so. Get read this book and you, you like flying. Uh, companies gift it to their customers and so on. So the echoes are good. Now, uh, um, Emil, um, ha- you've been flying for what, 25 plus years or something, something like that? Yeah, I've been a pilot for the Romanian national carrier here in Europe, in Eastern Europe, for Tarom for the last 20 years. And I have the privilege of, I'm a holder of a um, European Safety Aviation Agency examiner license for the last 18, 18 years or so. So uh, I have a vast career in aviation. I've been an instructor. I spent some time in administration of my company. For three years, I was the vice president of the company and the flight uh, operation um, manager. So uh, I, and my, my entire life, I was a storyteller. And uh, I've been telling story to my family about aviation, to my friends, to different audiences. And uh, for the last eight years or so, together with uh, Octavian, with the help of Octavian, who's a great uh, speaker, and a well-known speaker here in this part of Europe, um, I start to, to speak in front of different audiences and to throw bridges between my aviation, my love, my job, and other businesses. Actually, it's, uh, it's uh, funny how the professionals relate to all my stories because uh, there's a huge uh, know-how in the aviation. Imagine in 2019, there were 250,000 flights a day. Imagine commercial flights. So all those flights to be in the air at the same time, there is a, they, they were doing something good, isn't it? They communicate well, they were following the procedures, they were um, doing, uh, they were acting as professionals, not just the pilots, the traffic controllers, the pilots between them, the crew themselves, the aircraft was prepared well. So imagine this huge machine of uh, doing uh, this wonder, 250,000 flights a day. You know, I want to, uh, you said a, a lot of things there, but I want to, um, uh, I want to talk to you about communication in a second. But before, I, I just, one of the questions I had for you, so in all the flights that you've, and all the hours that you have in the air, uh, how many times uh, has anyone said, hey, I want to meet the pilot because I, uh, because I actually enjoy his communication style? Was that one of the first times that's ever happened to you? A lot of times. I remember once, once I, was in, uh, I was flying in Ireland and I was uh, flying a small aircraft, an APR-72, and it was uh, pretty rough at landing. It was gusting winds or so. So I approached the landing in Cork. It's an airport uh, west of uh, Ireland. And uh, approaching uh, the final, it was really, really uh, rough. I mean, uh, almost severe turbulence. So I landed. It was a perfect landing. And then an old guy came to me and said, look, I'm a retired RAF pilot. And I wanted to know you because I noticed your accent. You're not uh, English or Irish. And I wanted to know you. I said, how was back there? And he said, the people were holding hands. So <laughs> this I have lots of stories like this, you know, from all over the world because I really literally flew all over the world. So you had mentioned, you know, communication, and uh, I believe it's the book Outliers, uh, where they tell a story about Korean Airlines. Um, and for those of you who haven't read the book, um, you know, you should definitely check it out. But one of the one of the kind of stories in there was. Uh, there was a lo- lot to take away from that. There was a cultural um, uh, uh, thing going on there. Uh, but one of the biggest things was communication and lack thereof, which ultimately led to the death of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people multiple times over until they almost lost their, their license to fly. Um, talk a little bit about either one of you, you know, I guess, uh, you know, first uh, I'd like, you know, Emil, to, you know, talk a little bit about um, the training that you get or got uh, in, in, the, in the world of communication, because you literally every single day have people's lives, uh, you know, in your hands um, and, and talk about how important it is to not only communicate with the passengers, like you said, you just did. And also Octavian, that's what, that's what attracted him to you. Um, but also communicating with, you know, the other people involved in the flight, the co-pilot, the, you know, the airline um, attendants and things like that. 
Look, there's a sad saying that uh, aviation history was written in blood. And uh, I know that everybody's blaming communication for any, any mishap. Everything, something goes wrong in your life, in your family or in your professional life, you'll blame first the communication, isn't it? We didn't communicate well, the message wasn't passed well, uh, we didn't understand what the other part was saying or the party was saying. But in aviation, for us, it's a paramount important, uh, this uh, communication. Imagine this, uh, this, um, so this set, two pilots in a dark cockpit or a very, lit, very little, little lit cockpit facing forward, not seeing each other to validate the message bet uh, between them with the body language or the, the gestures. So they have only their voice and the, maybe the pitch of the voice, maybe the volume of the voice to pass a message in different situations. So every time I'm telling to my pilots that they are professional, professionals, uh, professional communicators, there are some of them that are surprised, but actually they are because there are different parts of the flight. Some, some parts of the flight are more relaxed, but some parts of the flight are critical. And it's the most important thing is to pass the message because every action or every feedback will start with a call. So you can have uh, huge amounts of uh, standard operating procedures. We have books all over with knowledge, but if you don't know how to apply those knowledge or to address or the right time with the right message, the right person, the, um, there will be a mishap, an incident or an accident. And unfortunately, uh, in uh, in the hist the past of uh, in the past of aviation, uh, modern aviation, we heard lots of stories like this because in you have in a cockpit you have a, a cockpit voice recorder, so this uh, machine is recording every uh, parameter of the aircraft and also the voice or noise is in the cockpit. And for so many times you, you heard in the past the captain yelling orders or being a boss in the cockpit and the co-pilot mouth shut all the way down to the crash, crash site. This is not possible anymore, but these are lessons to be learned. And aviation is learning very fast. Every time there's an incident or anywhere, anywhere in the world, immediately all the uh, aviation community will know about the incident and we'll talk about it, we'll train about this, not to happen again. So uh, this is the kind of know-how we, we have to share to other people. And we have it a lot in, in our book. We address also the Korean, uh, Korean uh, story you told us. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, right in, you know, uh, you know, right on the cover of the book and uh, the subtitle, you know, how to communicate, you know, Octavian, you know, I sometimes when I'm speaking to people that work for me, I'll say, are the words actually coming out of my voice because some uh, out of my mouth because sometimes maybe they're not I mean sometimes I feel like I'm saying something or or not only that if they do come out maybe it's not the the right way with uh, in the right situation kind of like what you were just talking about Emil and um, so Octavian talk about the importance sure. of communication not only obviously in the flights but just in business in general and how it can have truly life or death consequences. Well, um, it's it's the beginning of everything, if you think about it, because you know, we have many entrepreneurs listening to us or watching us today, right? So, well, who is the entrepreneur? It's someone with an idea. But that you have to sell that idea. You have to explain that idea to people that you want to work with, to customers, to suppliers. And if you're not successful in that... Uh, you might have the greatest idea on, on, uh, on the planet, but if no one knows, no one understands, no one helps you, you might not get very far. And also in large companies, there are many project ideas uh, popping up in different departments, but many of those ideas die too young because they were not presented properly, either because... Uh, there was too much technical detail too soon and the executives did not have the patience or because people were too passionate and uh, people were not being able, we did not see the rationale behind it. They just saw the passion. So what does aviation teach us? What is communication aviation? It's, it's very focused on the message and on the action that needs to follow the message. And um, what, what do you hear and see pilots do every, every time? Feedback. So if, if somehow our internet connection breaks now and we can't talk anymore, I would like our listeners to say, hey, feedback. What does it mean? It means, in a, just imagine the following scenario. We're watching a movie with aviation and we hear there's some trouble with an aircraft and the tower says to the aircraft, maintain heading 260, right? And then if we hear nothing coming from the pilot, it's unimaginable. We would immediately think that something's wrong because in reality the communication would continue with the pilot or co-pilot repeating back the message. This is 
Delta flight, Taron flight, whatever flight, one, two, three, maintaining heading 260. There is always a feedback. And the feedback, ideally, is the repeating of the message. The feedback is never nothing. The feedback is never okay, because what does okay mean? Okay means I understand, but I don't comply, or I understand and I will comply, but not now. Who knows? What does it mean for the entrepreneur? You had a presentation with your team, a meeting, you presented something. Uh, many people ask at the end, okay, um, all clear? And everybody says, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any questions? Uh, no. But that's a poor way of collecting feedback. A much better way of collecting feedback is, okay, who'd like to summarize what we've been discussing for the last hour or so? Just throw that out. And then you'll see what messages uh, come out from, from those people's minds. And if those messages or exactly what you wanted to share, that's fine. That's a communication success. That's a great yeah. meeting. If it's not, don't let them uh, go away. Okay, we'll see you next Monday because by next Monday, you want some action going. So really what makes aviation successful, it's not necessarily complicated thing. Yeah, it's complex things in terms of engines and navigation, but in terms of communication, it's simple things, but done well every time. One of them is feedback. Give feedback, make sure. Number two is if you're on the receiving end of a message and it's not entirely clear to you what that message was, captains and co-pilots are not, are not afraid to say, tower, say again, or repeat the message, please. They don't want to go and do something else because it's risky. We should do that too. If, if a client says something or somebody says, and it's not clear to us what it means, yeah, what do you mean? Just ask, how do you mean? What do you mean? Just spend one extra two minutes because it will give you a better understanding of the situation. So it's the simple things. And talking about Korean airlines and also in um, South America, um, there were many situations like that. Aviation has fixed that. Aviation, as Emil said, is a very fast learner, as opposed to, again, many um, entities in business, entrepreneurial large companies, where you see the same mistake happening again and again and again year after year, which is a pity. In aviation, that doesn't happen. In aviation today, there's a thing called CRM, Crew Resource Management, which is a, a set of training requirements and of operating requirements. And now the co-pilot is required to say if he or she disagrees or notices something, it can no longer be like, um, I wonder if the weather is fine. No, if you mean to say, let's make her turn right 15 degrees, you have to say it. And the captain is required to listen to that feedback because there's such a big amount of um, value at stake, firstly and foremost, human life. So uh, to sum it up, it's about simple things, but done well every time. It's, I'm in a hurry. Yes, but if we are in a hurry to close the meeting and we waste a week because people did not clearly understand what they need to do, was it good that we saved half an hour? No. Spend another 15 minutes and make sure everybody is aligned and on the same page. Yeah. And one more thing, if I add, if I may add in, a, in a cockpit, the communication is also impersonal. It's not about persons. It's not about actions. It's about... Uh, uh, giving a uh, right feedback about the reality and the pilots are focused in for the future they are focused uh, uh, focused on fixing things because you cannot complain and say the parking brake come on this thing breaks again or your communication wasn't well it wasn't good with the tower you have to solve things the aircraft moves flies with 850 kilometers per hour is 450 miles per hour so you cannot stop somewhere to fix things and uh, to to show the other person who's the boss or who was right or wrong. You are uh, we are trained to, uh, to, to fix things. We are trained to look in the future. And that's why the communication between us and the feedback, the feedback, it's impersonal. And I have this, I like this example with my, my co-pilot. She was uh, just, uh, she was Abinicio, just training then. I was training her. I was an instructor on the left hand seat. She was a co-pilot in the right hand seat. And in a crowded environment, I heard her almost yell at me, landing here down. And I realized in a second, I was so concentrated in other things or details that she was calling me twice. Or uh, This was the third time where she was calling me for the action. And it's, I, I know that accepting feedback, it's not a thing that people with, uh, usually look at something which is helpful, but actually it's, a, it's not intuitive, but accepting feedback for your team from your team, it will make you better. Your product, my flight is better when my co-pilots correct me or give me feedback or, on my, what I'm doing wrong. So I have a better overview. I get rid of some of the workload and I can focus on the, what it matters, 
knowing that I have a very good uh, trained pilot next to me who's able and willing to give me the feedback as long as I'm accept accepting it. Wow, uh, so much stuff I want to talk I'll talk about uh, from, from, from what you both said uh, in a second. Um, but we are on with Emil Dobrovsky. Dobrovsky, yes, Dobrovsky. Uh, and Octavian Pantish, uh, the co-authors of the book Dark Cockpit, how to communicate, lead, and be in control at all times like an airline captain. If you'd like some more information uh, about this book, you can just go to darkcockpitbook.com. Again, it's darkcockpitbook.com. It's also available uh, on Amazon. And I tell you, I just, um, if, uh, one of the, again, I think I've done this maybe once or twice before we've had two guests on, but I'm already fascinated um, by what both of these gentlemen are talking about, because it does apply uh, in pretty much every facet of your life. And, and um, so again, if you'd, if you'd like some more information, you want to pick up this book, it's already a bestseller. It's doing some great things. And by the way, as you all know, uh, I help authors market books and promote books and sell books. And this is one of those books that I believe everybody can read because it's a different perspective uh, than what most people think about. You know, when you think about someone who's flying a plane and has been doing it for 20 plus years, literally people's lives online every single day, uh, what he has learned throughout the years is just really remarkable. And with his co-author as well and his experience together, it's like it's like a perfect marriage. So again, go to darkcockpitbook.com. Today's episode is brought to you by FrontRowBenefits.com, connecting consumers and businesses with front row access to the greatest health insurance that the United States has to offer. Visit FrontRowBenefits.com. Folks, listen, if you're like me, if you own a business, if you have a family, or if you're an individual and you're looking for front row access to healthcare, maybe you're tired of your premiums going up. Maybe you don't want to pay those high deductibles anymore. Maybe you're tired of paying more and more for your monthly prescriptions and you want to make sure that you're getting that vip access that front row access then visit frontrowbenefits.com and get a free quote they're connecting consumers and businesses with the top level insurance carriers in the united states at discounted prices visit frontrowbenefits.com that's frontrowbenefits.com Um, so man, you guys just said a lot of stuff and you had asked before we went live, how much time do we have? I don't know. We're going to see, we're going to see how, how long we can go because I'm just like feverishly writing notes for, for, for both of you. But I think just, I mean, I'll just real quick. Um, uh, and then obviously jump in whenever Octavian, um, sure. the, the, you know, when people think about the, a pilot, right. And I think of like, you know, like the book, Avi I mean, the movie aviator, and you think about the, the heydays of flying pan pan am and 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 you know you know as, as a pilot you're 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 definitely like this type a type personality you're a leader which you guys talk a lot about in the book leadership but also i think sometimes my people might think of a captain as um the um you know kind of the all-knowing omnipotent kind of power and like you know everything and therefore no one even has the right to even question you, but, uh, you know, Octavian, you had mentioned it before, Emil did as well, is about those simple, I mean, the title of my first book is titled Ask More, Get More. Talk a little bit about, I mean, whoever wants to jump in first, whatever, about the importance of being that leader, but also, like you guys said, being able to take that feedback, which a lot of leaders aren't willing to do because they're like, hey, I'm, I'm the guy, I'm the gal, I, I, this is my fucking ship, this is, this is my plan, you don't tell me what to do. But that is such a horrible way to run a business and obviously a horrible way to, 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 run a, to run a play. Feel free to jump in, whoever wants to take this first. But I just really want to kind of drive that point home. I will just start because I will let, I know what Octavian wants to say. So let him do it. <laughs> I will just want to say something before that. So um, uh, the way we wrote the book, it's, there are my stories, but uh, Octavian has a good eye on thinking, on looking at things on a different angle. And he told me once, this is a good example of how the book was wrote, actually. So he, said, he told me, now imagine you have a, a, a different team every day, isn't it? I said, yeah, of course. Uh, in a bigger company, you, you may never fly again with this person or persons again for, the, for a year. So how can you, how do you, how do you do to present in front of them as a leader, not as a boss. So this is things we discussed before we wrote the book. So this is the kind of, um, uh, I would say, remarks 
uh, Octavian is able to make or to uh, to ob obtain from uh, for my uh, stories, you know. So, but in, essence, have, but in uh, essence, though, you are the boss. When you get it, when you if you're if you're the the captain, you are the boss. Yeah, they know already that I have four stripes. When I'm presenting in front of them, and they know how hard it is to become a captain on that company or on that company or on that company, they know exactly how hard it is for a person to upgrade from the first officer to the captain side or Imagine to be an instructor or an examiner or a test pilot. So they know already who I am. But if I'm going there and I, I am being too bossy, they will never be willing to offer me feedback to let me know when I'm wrong. And in an aircraft, this is, I don't want to say a great word, but it's death. It is in death. an aircraft, when you have, yes, when you have a big boss in an aircraft, nobody wants to work with him. And he's like an orchestra man doing all the things Altogether, this is not possible in a modern cockpit, actually. This was happening 20 years ago or more. Okay, you talk about that again, like what you know, Emil just, you know, kind of expanded on and what I talked about as well is, again, I think you have a lot of CEOs um, yeah. and there's a lot of misinformation out there. Look, there's all, there, there's a million books I've written, several of them as well, and you, you guys have as well about business principles and all this sort of stuff. But I think it is, I believe, I'm a believer in what you, what you guys are talking about is being able to, one, yeah, you're going to be the leader, but to be able to take that feedback um, and absorb it and, and, and kind of use that information, um, you know, to, 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 to fly in the right direction, so to speak, yeah. you know, talk, talk about that a little bit more. Sure. What, what, what captains understand is that um, flying a plane is a team effort. It's first and foremost, it's about the people in the cockpit, the two of them, but it's also with the flight attendants. And there's a larger circle, everyone who attends to the plane, from the catering people to the technicians who check everything. And um, they understand that the best thing happens is when everyone brings their own contrib their contribution. Now, if you, uh, if you boss around too much, you lose that initiative, you lose that contribution. They might notice something and they say, <laughs> he knows everything, he'll figure it out, whatever, I'm just doing my job. We don't want that. They don't want that in aviation and we should not want that in a company. Um, since we mentioned book, there's Marshall Goldsmith book, um, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Marshall he talks has about- been a, Marshall has been a guest. Yeah. Ah, okay, great. I, maybe he might have he might have mentioned one of those. The, he made a list of several mistakes that managers do, and uh, this discussion reminds me of one of them, which is adding too much value, feeling the need to correct, to have an input of, of on everything. What is the consequence on that? The consequence is that you disengage others. What do great pilots do? They engage others. They grow others. There's a constant um, effort from the captain side to grow others which is very important in aviation, and you don't find it in uh, all the other places. There are places where once you're a captain, it's not that you, you don't want the other ones to grow, but if they do, it's, their, it's, it's up to them. And there are even some industries where if I become a super senior leader, then I'll do my best to consolidate that every single day and keep others down. In aviation, especially in the last 30, 40 years, captains understand that, uh, yeah, we all saw, see the movies, the Pan Am, the Virgin, the whatever, the pilots walking through the airport and everybody, whoa, whoa. Yeah. But uh, beyond that, the reality. You're, you're, listen, I know you're jealous. I can just tell, by the way, let, I mean, we can just tell, by the way, hey, he was, he's jealous of you. Let's, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or you, uh, it would be great to have a, a movie played by uh, right. Denzel Washington or Tom Hanks or whatever. Yeah. But the reality is, every single day, and one of the chapters in the book, by the way, is a new crew every day. And uh, if if our readers and people who are just go to darkcockpitbook.com, they can download that chapter for free. We talk about this reality. Hey, you have a new crew every day, so you have to prove yourself or destroy that paradigm of. I know everything, I don't need you, you're good for nothing. No, that's not what they want in aviation. That's not what we want in a team. And we talked there about several things, five actually, that you can do to make sure that uh, you stimulate their engagement, that you bring th them together with you on board this mission that you might have. For Emil is to fly successfully from point A to point B in safety and in comfort and on time. For a business, it might be to succeed in whatever industry we are, but uh, you cannot do that as a team. And the more, you, the more you want to be on the stage, 
the harder it is to win the hearts and minds, especially the hearts uh, of the people who are for you. And let me just make a quick comment about the world we live in today. Uh, my other book is about work-life balance and I'm writing now about the future of work. The world with COVID, COVID is a tragedy. It's bad, obviously. There's no other way to put it. But it has brought on some opportunities. Like the world is a much smaller place. Because of online, if I'm not happy with my employer in my city, I can get another job, not only in my city, depending on what I do, I can get another job with a, with, with a company in any city I want to. So it's not like I'm destined to work for this uh, um, uh, boss that everybody hates. No, I have options. So if our uh, um, people who are, who are watching us and li listening to us, they have teams, Th the greatest people in your teams, they have options now that they did not have before to work for people uh, uh, 5,000 miles, not just 50 or 100 miles away from their home, which means I should pay even more attention to see what they want, to let them shine, to let them contribute. In the end, yeah, you're still the boss. The captain does all the signing and the, the announcement is, welcome to this flight, the captain is this, and that's how it is and that's how it's going to be. But uh, unless it's a team effort, it's much harder. You know, Emil, uh, actually, uh, Stephen, you, you touched upon it a little bit, but uh, I, I, and I mentioned earlier, so I um, I started to, to to take flight lessons on like little Cessnas and archers, and uh, and I think I got like twenty hours in, and then I got into the classroom stuff. And uh, I'm a lawyer by trade, and I realized you you have to have to be um, you have to have to have a pretty good solid understanding of math. Uh, which is definitely not my thing. So I just decided, um, I, you know what, uh, I was going to fly back and it's a long story, but anyway, so I, I kind of understand. And one of the things that, that, that I wanted to get to um, about that in our team, and you talked about, you know, you have a new, you have a new team, essentially a lot, a lot uh, as a, as a captain of a flight. Um, and, but there's also, and having kind of done this on a small, small aircraft, you can do it yourself, like you, you're doing the pre-flight pre -flight check and you go and thing and go in and checking the wings and, you know, and checking the propeller and all the oil and the gas and checking the engine. I'm doing all that stuff on a small little Archer. Um, but you, uh, uh, when you're, when you're in the, you're in the cockpit and a lot of the stuff that's done outside of the plane, you're trusting other people. And there's also systems in place. Talk a little bit about trust and then also systems and how you're effectively trusting the system um, that's been developed over years at, at, as an airline pilot. And, and Octavian, if you want to expand, expand sure. upon that about, on the system side of things as well, because when you talk about Marshall Goldsmith, he, he talks about that, but I also had Nolan Bushnell, who's the founder of Atari and Chuck E. Cheese's, mm -hmm. and I learned the value of systems when I worked at Chuck E. Cheese when I was a kid. So talk about trust in systems, if, if you could, Emil. So first of all, all the persons, all the professionals working around an aircraft, if they are pilots, cabin crew, technicians, engineers, uh, loaders, everybody, air traffic controllers, they are highly trained professionals. And that means that we are in a, in a very friendly uh, workplace. Why? Because flying is not for, uh, I, as I have a word, flying is for birds. So when you make a, to make a, a 150 or 350 or 500 tons aircraft to fly in the air, there's also a wonder, a miracle, isn't it? So, uh, and uh, of course the, the conditions are adverse. It's not a friendly atmosphere to fly. When you look outside the window, it's warm and nice inside, but uh, uh, there's a th inch thick um, uh, wind, uh, windshield between you and minus 70 degrees outside. And uh, uh, if, if you understand what I mean. So that means that everybody involved, they will make sure the aircraft, first of all, is safe. Just the other day, I was walking around, checking my, uh, my uh, aircraft on the ground. And I, I start to think how many times I did this in my 20 years, uh, 20, 28 years in, uh, in uh, an airline. I think I did it for hundreds of th uh, hundreds of thousands of times do you do that every I, time I mean, wait do, do you do you actually do that on all of like I, see, I don't even know this stuff i've never seen it before so does a captain do the outside pre-flight check on a commercial flight always there's a technician take, checking the aircraft before you they will sign a slip saying that the aircraft is uh, uh dispatchable so it's uh, okay to fly sometimes with some small defects which are acceptable they are wrote in a book 
And then the captain goes and do his check. Okay. The check is a walk around the, uh, uh, around the aircraft to check all the, all the wheels, the engines, if there are any leaks, things like this, antennas, lots and lots of things, the tires. So uh, imagine if you, if you just go inside, if you do it very easy and you sign that the aircraft, that from that moment, the aircraft is yours. If on your next stop, they will find a scratch on your aircraft, it's your fault, it's your responsibility. You have to answer, how did you do the scratch if it's not written in a book, in a deviation list? So imagine how responsible a person who's a captain or a first officer, if it's raining, I have this joke, because if it's raining, uh, if there are 10% chances of rain, there are 90% chances that the first officer will do the walk around. This is a joke in aviation. So imagine that person, how responsible is doing the walk around. You maybe see a person with a, a vest just going with a coffee and looking at the aircraft but he looks so responsible because after he signed it, this machine costs hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars. And this person takes it with a signature and it's just the beginning. Then we'll go in the cockpit, we'll do the test. So before each flight, before the takeoff, the captain and the crew has lots of things to do and to check every single takeoff and every single uh, departure. Yeah, so talk about talking about talking about trust. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm walking around the aircraft behind the, or after it was checked by a technician, and sometimes I found some defects. This is a bad thing for the technician, isn't it? If I check and there some lights are not working, why I didn't uh, saw them uh, before me? But generally speaking, 99% of the cases or more, the the aircraft, if there will be something on it. The technician will notice it first and they will tell you, look, the aircraft has this defect. Let's check it if you go, can go or not. And this is just the beginning because after that, we close the doors. And that from that moment, this metal tube filled with seats, with uh, machines, with systems, with knobs and with switches, th this will become like uh, the, the place where if something goes wrong, only the professional inside will solve the thing. So you have to trust your colleagues. You have to trust your cabin crew because sometimes they will give you the right hint at the right moment. And we have a perfect example in the book about this. Yeah. So, and then you take off. No, you, sorry, before takeoff, you sign the load sheet, the loading. If you do this, if you sign the load sheet in the past, they will say, okay, how many tons? 152 tons. Okay, put 155. Let's round it up. I said, why to round it up? Because my signature is for 152. Yeah, but you know how they are. Maybe they put more luggage. Come on. This was happening like 20 years ago. I said, if I think that they put more luggage and they present to me a load sheet, which is wrong, I will never sign it. But if I sign it, I will take it exactly the numbers from there. And then no, you take I, off. I, uh... And then you trust the air traffic controllers telling you the right wind, the right conditions, the right uh, and proper... The, the surface condition of the runway, and then you trust their air traffic controller uh, because they are uh, controlling the airspace around you because you take off in a crowded environment. The aircraft, the, the airport is, uh, is surrounded by air, many other aircraft trying to land or take off. So you trust people all the time. And this is a very good lesson for other, other businesses. Octavian, uh, well, actually, before we do that, you know, it's funny, uh, Emil, as I'm listening to you talk about the weight distribution and load balancing, and when I, when I would get in these little you know, uh, Cessnas or, uh, or archers or those ones I was training on, uh, I'm like 250 pounds. And then, you know, so then, then you have, then I had my, my trainer and then I was like, well, you know, I could probably put someone else in there, but it, it, it's literally like a couple pound differential versus like, so if I had someone in the, in the back that might be 10 pounds over, then the flight should not, should not take off. And I was like, you know, I don't know if I trust myself enough uh, to do that. So, so I decided, <laughs> although I do uh, real quick, I do like the SR-90, uh, SR-22s. I don't, I'm sure you've seen those things where they have the ballistic uh, parachutes. So I'm like, ah, you know, it goes up, something goes wrong. We'll just, you know, hit that thing and we'll, we'll, we'll go down. <laughs> um, so Octavian, um, sure. talk about, you know, so when, I, when I'm listening to trust, I mean, yeah. um, and I think about the high level of trust that you do have for I'm guessing there's probably hundreds of people involved in a flight that people don't realize, um, you know, um, 
in business, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan over here uh, coined the phrase trust but verify basically about, you know, the, the, our, 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 the Cold War. Um, talk about that in business because yeah. you do want to trust people. You do want to uh, give people, you do want to empower people, especially like on the executive level, even all the way down. It's kind of how I, I always, always am. And I think I've made mistakes in business where I've trusted people too much. Uh, yeah. And I didn't verify when, in fact, I should. Where, whereas, you know, Amina, like, if you have to trust but verify as well. Um, so talk about that, Octavian, in business sure. and, and that kind of that that kind of like weird uh, area where it's 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 a little bit murky. Sure, there are, there are a few valid, very valuable lessons for entrepreneurs here. So Emil said, hey, I'm surrounded by professionals. Practically, that's what he was saying, right? Tower um, uh, officers, engineers. By contrast, in business, sometimes we're cheap. We employ whoever we find for accounting, for a call center, for whatever. So what is the message? Don't do that. You can trust if, if two, at least two things happened before. Number one, I recruited the best I could find. Yeah, but they cost more. It's the best investment you can make. And number two, they're well-trained. In aviation, everyone goes to training. It's not like even captains, even Emil, he's an, he's an instructor of pilots and he's an examiner of pilots, but all pilots have to attend twice per year, four hours each training and then examination. He does that for himself uh, and everybody does that. In companies, yeah, we train the new guys, but I just recruited a, a super sales guy from a different company. He doesn't need any training. He's good. He'll bring me in uh, customers. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. So um, if you work with the best people you can find, number one. Number two, if they're well-trained, then you can trust them because, and I'm sure uh, if our listeners were able to share their stories now, I'm sure they would have stories of uh, somebody picking up the phone and ruining a relationship with a customer because they were did not care enough or did not know exactly what to say when a complaint came in or something, or someone from accounting screwing up something. And then we ended up paying fines where we were not supposed to and things like that. So the what is the message? Work with the best that you can find and make sure they're well-trained all the time. Now, tra trust but verify. What does it mean in terms of systems in aviation and what can we learn from here? One word or two words actually, checklists. Aviation lives on checklists and I'm sure you in your training for aviation, you had to follow uh, Mike some yeah. checklists. Yeah, before yeah, that. Yeah. The pre-fight yeah. pre checklist, we call it, right? That's yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. There, there's checklists for everything. Now, well, once you go behind the scenes, and if people read the book, they will go behind the scenes. You discover there's a checklist for everything. There's a pre-flight. There's a pre-taxi checklist. And then before engine start. And then before takeoff. And then at every single stage, there are nine or ten uh, uh, ch separate checklists that they have to fulfill. Here's the wonderful part they do that every time and they follow the checklist and sometimes it happens that they're flying from point a to point b uh they're staying there 45 minutes passengers disembark there's cleaning and then new passengers come in and they fly back maybe the captain and the co-pilot do not even leave the cockpit it's the same plane it's the same day good weather everything they've done the checklist on arrival checking fuel checking everything before they move from the gate they check a number of things again. And none of them says, ah, come on, we've been doing this for 28 years or it's the same airplane, let's just go ahead and fly. It never happens. So it's the, and Emil has a frame for that. It's like the heartbeat. You get used to the heartbeat and there's a rhythm behind it and you do things because they're there. And if that happens, then you can uh, know that you've, of course, they don't need, one of them takes out the checklist and reads and uh, uh, challenge and response and everything. They could do all those things even without pulling out the checklist, but they do take out the checklist and they read and check just to make sure that they're doing everything what they can. What happens in companies? By contrast, in many, single, in many situations, the entrepreneurs, ah, they know it all. Just imagine an assistant coming to an entrepreneur. Excuse me, yes, uh, we have a, an important negotiation coming up. Uh, I prepared a checklist uh, of what is our interest, what is our worst case scenario. Would you like to go over that? Many entrepreneurs will say, hey, this is not my first rodeo. I've been here before. Let's just go ahead and do it. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work to the best situation that we could have. Why? For several reason maybe we were too arrogant again but also because maybe we forgot something in the preparation phase so um, what is one thing that um, many of us can learn from aviation 
checklists. There's a good book on that subject, by the way, uh, The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande. If you didn't have him on the show, you have to. Uh, he's a surgeon and he talks about the, the value of checklists inspired from aviation. And he shares how he brought the checklists in the hospitals he's been working and how the number of infections went down and how the uh, total number of days of hospitalization went down because everything was respected every single time. So everything went better. So what do we, what do we need in companies? Well, um, entrepreneurs, they hate the big corporate procedures, whatever, but let's take the good side in that. The checklist, the uh, number one, two, three things that will prevent us from failing or from performing badly uh, in what we do. Um, now, uh, if I may add just one thing about the checklist and about the training, because nobody likes checklists. Nobody. Why? To do it again and again and again. If you have six, six legs this day, to do the six times the same amount of checklist and never, ever found a mistake? Or this week, not one mistake? It's, it's really hard, isn't it? But if you train the people to understand how vital some forgotten items are in the flight, and if they, if they are training the simulator, the full fly simulator that way, when we found a lost, uh, a forgot item on, your, on our checklist, we look our ch like children and we are so happy. Why? Because after a month doing the checklist, we found the mistake, which was a uh, uh, potential, uh, potential danger for our takeoff or for landing or whatever the uh, flight phase was. So imagine this scene of two professionals doing the checklist all the time for each phase of the flight and never in a week or in a month finding one mistake. And no, when uh, it's, a, it's a matter of training because are, the, the stakes are so high, it's very difficult to, to, um, to understand how, how can you do it? How can you fly without the checklist or how can you fly without uh, following the procedures? Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. You know, uh, I, I know we don't have a ton of time left, but but when we do come back, I want to talk to a little bit about, you know, again, in the subtitle of the book, you talk about how to be in control. But I also want to talk about, and you touched upon this a little bit, Emil, as well, and, and I'm sure Octavian, you can chime in about, I, I'm a proponent of, I believe anything can be fixed. Uh, and, um, you know, when you're in the air, after doing all the things that you're supposed to do, uh, I'm sure there's been many instances uh, in your career, Emil, where you had to fix something. And if you didn't, things could be catastrophic. So in a second, I, I want to talk uh, a little bit about that. Again, on, I'm on with, with the co-authors of Dark Cockpit, how to communicate, lead, and be in control at all times, like an airline captain, Captain Emil Dobrovolsky and Octavian Pantish. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a really, that I, I think I got it right, right? You give me the thumbs up, man. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this is one of those books that I believe everybody should read. You know, and I say that a lot. Well, I say that a lot. I mean, I, I work with authors all the time and I see books all the time. I get books sent to me all the time. But what I really like about this is the perspective uh, of, of, of an airline pilot and then intertwined with with a, with a professional speaker, uh, business consultant, CEO, and kind of taking those two worlds and bring them to, bringing them together. Because Emil just mentioned this earlier. The stakes are, are literally life and death. Uh, when when you're flying a plane, a lot of times it can be like that in business, but we don't think of it like that. And I think if we do think of things like that, I think our businesses uh, would run a lot smoother. So again, if you'd like some more information about both of these gentlemen, you can go to darkcockpitbook.com, go to darkcockpitbook.com. And they're running a special where you can actually download a chapter for free um, just by going there. So you can go to darkcockpitbook.com. Uh, you can connect with them on LinkedIn. Or you just also go right to um, to, to Amazon, uh, all of the world uh, where, where the book is available uh, as well. Again, go to darkcockpitbook.com and get your free chapter. And I think once you get that free chapter, you're going to pay for pay for the book because it, it's well worth it. A lot of business books out there. This is one of those ones I think everybody should take a look at. Um, so, you know, uh, we talked about a lot of stuff. We talked about systems. We talked about trust. Um, and we talked about, you know, we haven't talked a lot about control, but kind of a little bit in the beginning. But when, when uh, again, I, I think about the decisions that I've made in business. And a lot of times we, again, we go through the checklist, we have our systems, we do all the things we're supposed to do. And Octavian, you said it earlier as well, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Well, if you're in the air <laughs> uh, and you have hundreds of people's lives literally on, on the line and something goes wrong, 
uh, Emil, um, talk a little bit about that process and, and how that kind of translates in business as well, because if you're in the air and something goes wrong, um, checklists or not, like, you know, there, there's, there's more to it than that. You have to be able to fix something or, 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 or it's catastrophic. Talk about that kind of mental thought process and how you can be in control on that, because it's got to be an extremely stressful situation. Um, listening to your question, I was thinking about one example I give all the time to my pilots, first of all, and then to other people, of course. So imagine a takeoff. You're taking off from the, well, from the beginning of the runway, full length of the runway, maybe not. The runway is 3,500 meters uh, long. It's perfect, dark cockpit. Everything is set. All the checklists are done. You're, you have the wind and the conditions and you set the power for takeoff. Now, you're push back in your chair, you accelerate, you have a 100 uh, 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 knots threshold, we have some landmarks, the pilots, they are always with their minds ahead of the aircraft to anticipate things, and we have some landmarks to help us doing that. And everything is okay, you are accelerating, the, the runway becomes narrow and narrow and narrow as, as you are accelerating through 140, 150 knots for takeoff, to lift off the aircraft. And in that moment, you hit uh, a car in a, in a runway, or maybe one of the engines ingests one, a, a big bird, or something happens, So, and there's an explosion, you have to abort takeoff. Now, from the, it's not a relaxation during a takeoff because it's a, it's a critical phase of the flight, but when you stop, those hundreds of tons to stop them on the runway, there's a process, okay? There's a huge deceleration. You hear people screaming. Uh, there are some smoke maybe coming in. You see fire and uh, you declare mayday. You stop the aircraft and you have to do the emergency drill. Now, the question is, what do you think the captain will do this moment? How is he, he or she in control of the whole situation? Because he knows better. He's the, well, the, the best trained pe person there. He's the person everybody rely on to take the good decision. What do you think the captain will do? Well, the captain does nothing. Training, right? No, the captain does nothing. The captain actually, he, he, or he or she pulls his uh, or her chairs back to have a better overview. And the entire emergency drill is performed by the co-pilot who's trained to do that. The, cap the captain builds his this or her decision. Why? Uh, What's the, what's the side of the engine on fire? Where is the wind blowing from? Uh, do I have dangerous goods in the cargo hold? How many passengers? How much fuel do I have? Where I'm stop at? Where I have to run away, to uh, run away from the explosion, the potential explosion with the passenger, uh, run away from the incoming uh, fire brigade trucks. So this is the way to control things, doing nothing, just pulling your chair back and having a better overview and build your decision because the co-pilot is a well-trained professional to do this job. And then the decision is yours. Yeah, you have to, uh, maybe you have you extinguish the fire, so you cancel the alert, you cancel the evacuation, or maybe you have to evacuate the passengers, you have to communicate with the tower, where are you at, what happens there, or what, uh, how, many, how much uh, fuel do you have left in the aircraft, because the fire brigade will want to know that. And then you leave with your hat on, the symbol of power, and. Uh, you, you yell, follow me, and all the passengers will follow you in a non-danger uh, area. So this is a, an example, a non-intuitive example of how to be in control and to make a best uh, or better decision doing nothing. You know, just sitting back, pull your chair back, look at the cockpit from afar, because so many times I have the co-pilot, I have the captain on, uh, on examination, with, uh, they came uh, in, my, in front of me after the training session and they see they have marginal standard on evacuation. And they wonder why, because they are doing it and try, they're so afraid or maybe they are getting so much into the action. They want to do some actions and they forget some small items. Maybe the engines are not stopped yet. And he commands the order the evacuation and the engines are still running. And it's small details like this. So this is a perfect example how to be in control doing nothing. By wow. contrast, if I may add on that. Right, um, hold on, before I go, we don't, we don't have a lot of time, but, but, but I also want to just really kind of, uh, just kind of reiterate what you're saying. You're saying doing nothing, but in reality, you've actually already done a lot yeah. preparing for that. It's about the yeah. preparation. So it's not really doing, I think, I just want to make sure people don't misinterpret what you're saying. It's like, ah, the plane's on fire. Fuck it, we're just going to do nothing. 
you 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 already have, you already have a system in place. You already have procedures in place. You know what they are. You have your co-pilot who you trust because that's part of their training. You sit back. You evaluate the situation. Then the decision is made after. So uh, yep. it, it's a, it's powerful to say do nothing. And I might use that as a headline for this uh, for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Octavian, so yeah, I remember we talked a little yeah. bit earlier about timing, but we don't have a lot of time left. So yeah, uh, just bring that drive that point home. I just wanted to point out the difference to business, right? In a crisis in aviation on that runway, maybe it's fog, maybe it's night. Who is the busiest? The co-pilot is very busy. The flight attendants are very busy explaining and guiding and helping people um, uh, get used to what's going on. The pilot, and th there's a phrasing which is not typical, they, they build their decision. By contrast in companies when there's a crisis, who is the busiest? It's the entrepreneur, right? They make all the phone calls. They call people in the meeting. They they direct order, do this, do that, do that. They're very busy. But being busy is very easy. Uh, knowing when to uh, take a five second or two days time out to reflect on what's going on so that you can arrive at a better decision, that's harder to do. But that is the right thing to do. Uh, and in of course, in that runway example, it's about life and death for the passengers. In business, it might be about losing a customer or losing several customers or making a profit or a loss. But it's still important. And um, um, we see many people that are uh, who are very busy today. They get busy. Oh, it's COVID. I have to work more. Most likely, yes, but if you work more in the wrong direction, it's not the it's not the best thing to do. I love it. Again, I want to thank both of you, uh, gentlemen, for being here today. Uh, this is what we like to do here on the Alden Report, having real people with real experience and also uh, diverse backgrounds. Uh, I didn't even ask who these guys are, but I can almost guarantee they're not here in the United States. Uh, and so also it's the benefit uh, of, of uh, things like technology, right? With Zoom yeah. uh, and things like this, we can have entrepreneurs from all over the world uh, giving their perspective. If you'd like some more information about Emil and Octavian, you can check out their book. It's called Dark Cockpit, How to Communicate, Lead, and Be in Control at All Times Like an Airline Captain. Uh, the book is available at darkcockpitbook.com. They're actually allowing you to, to get a chapter for free. Uh, again, you just go to darkcockpitbook.com. Uh, you can connect with them on LinkedIn. The book is available on, on Amazon all over the world as well. Um, you know, uh, Emil, Octavian, uh, it's really uh, it's really been a pleasure having both of you. Hey, before I let you go, uh, um, um, uh, Emil, do you have any do you have glasses with you, but that you can grab real quick? Do you have do you wear uh, glasses like that? No, this? unfortunately, I have them on my. I should have asked place. you because you would be the perfect guy. Because I always try to make people wear the glasses, so um, we we'll probably have to have you back ju just for that reason. Um, so it's really been a, a, an amazing show. My name is Mike Alden. That's Octavian Pantish and Emil Dobrovolsky, and uh, we will see you soon. Today's episode is brought to you by FrontRowBenefits.com, connecting consumers and businesses with front row access to the greatest health insurance that the United States has to offer. Visit FrontRowBenefits.com. Folks, listen, if you're like me, if you own a business, if you have a family, or if you're an individual and you're looking for front row access to healthcare, maybe you're tired of your premiums going up. Maybe you don't want to pay those high deductibles anymore. Maybe you're tired of paying more and more for your monthly prescriptions, and you want to make sure that you're getting that VIP access, that front row access, then visit FrontRowBenefits.com and get a free quote. They're connecting consumers and businesses with the top level insurance carriers in the United States at discounted prices. Visit frontrowbenefits.com. That's frontrowbenefits.com.